Hi, my name is Ward Jean Stroud. We're going to do a little watercolor tutorial today. Boat in a house. Just for something fun. A lot of you have said um, that I've been doing a lot of time lapses at a higher speed. Um, because I think people's attention spans are pretty short. But since you asked, I'm going to do a painting for you today uh, in real time. So we're going to do it the slow way. Now, this painting, uh, this this image never has existed. I'm doing something just out of my imagination. I love painting from photos and I love painting in plain air. But every now and then it's fun to just make something up as you go. So that's what's going to happen here. I'm going to draw a little house here. And it's going to live up on a hill. I'm going to put a little boat down in the corner. And wonder what the people that live there do. Where they've been in adventures in their little boat. And yeah, create a little, little world into itself. I'm using very basic shapes here. I don't want this house to um, come too far forward and be the, the focal point. The boat is definitely going to be the focal point of the painting. By keeping the shapes very, very basic um, and not all the way down. I want the house to move back a little bit, so I'm going to put shrubs in front of it. I don't want it to be on the edge of a cliff. I want it to be sitting back away from the, the edge a little bit. And here's a nice little pro tip. By using the pencil to darken those little window panes, those will probably survive to the end of the painting. And I think it just gives a nice effect. Um, yeah. So I'm using Arches 140 pound cold press uh, watercolor paper here and a number five pencil lead in my in my pencil holder. Um, going to be painting with American Journey paints today. Compliments of my friends over there at Cheap Joe's who sponsored this video and support me. Thank you very much, Cheap Joe's. I love you. You can find YouTubes on how to draw a boat using the number eight. Uh, it's really fun. I think I have a video somewhere on how to do that also. Um, I find myself sitting around sometimes. I'll just sketch boats, making figure eights. It's a lot of fun. But yeah, that's how I did the little boat there. Um, I highly recommend you look that up or suss that out and find it. It's a really fun way to draw boats. I'm just adding some more window shapes in there. So a nice little house just kind of chilling up there on the hill. I'm using a kneaded eraser to pick up pencil marks that I'm not super happy about. 
So the boat will definitely be the focal point in this painting and I'll paint around it um, when I do my wash. I'll cut around that boat so it stays nice and bright white. Everything else is going to get kind of pushed back a little bit. We're coming up on the first wash here. I always paint heaven and earth first. So I'll paint my sky and all the ground or ocean if I'm doing a seascape. Um, and that'll be the first part of the wash. And then normally I'll let that dry. We're going to do a lot more uh, painting in this. There's a big grass hill that's going to be living here soon. And to get the effect of just really deep, thick sawgrass, you know, growing like on a beachy cliffside. I'm going to put a lot of colors in it. going to throw some darks in there and some different Naples yellow and some um, War Jean Dusty Green and, and really try to get some some nebulous shapes. I have always said if you let watercolor do what it does, it's just absolutely magic. It does all the work and we get all the credit. So by keeping my board at an angle and um, adding some water and letting the paints and things all run together, I'm going to get a nice nebulous effect and, and it'll do what watercolor does best and that's that it's just organic. It's a magical medium. So I'm throwing some water on here. I took a, a big flat brush. I'm just kind of moving it around a little bit just so I have some dry and some wet spots and that's going to help give me some texture um, when I start laying in the wash. No real rhyme or reason to how that's all happening. So I'm going to start out some Janet's Wild Rose. And uh, I just like this color. I want a kind of a dusky sort of end of the day, but still the last bit of good sunshine still out. So we've got some blue sky showing through there with a little bit of cerulean blue. And since I kind of put the, some little damp spots on the paper as I was going, this is going to be very organic. So I'm going to add some blues and kind of paint right through the house. If any of the color stays on the house, and I'm going to lift a little bit back out here in a minute, but any of the ambient paint that gets on that house, it's just going to look like the, the sunset, the setting sun is just reflecting on it. And because watercolor does magic things, as long as my board's at an angle and the paint is wet, it's just going to keep moving and blending in and it's just... It's like a living thing, it's just beautiful. So that's my signature color, War Jean Dusty Green. It's a mix of orange and turquoise. Uh, and as it separates, it almost goes 3D. It's just a really great color. And I'm mixing it with some Naples yellow. And the reason I added the yellow there is I wanted um, some sunspots. I, 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 I've painted this once before and it turned out a little on the dark side. And so this time I want to make sure that I'm uh, leaving some yellow because I wanted to have some sun, I want some sun spots on the grass, some lights and some darks. So I'm just going to paint on the color and let the let gravity from the angle that the paper is sitting at and the water and the paints all just mix and do their magical dance and see what happens. I'm using a squirrel mop brush too, a pseudo squirrel. It's a synthetic um, mop brush from Cheap Joe's. And it's just fabulous for putting down big first washes. I'm just putting lots of paint in there and kind of swashing it around like that's why they call it a mop. I'm just mopping color around. Being a little more careful to cut around the boat. And I do want to add a darker line um, horizontally from the bottom of the boat across the paper just to give a nice horizontal to the painting. And then I'll spend a lot of time with brushes working um, some big sawgrass shapes in. Now there I just took, dip my fingers in my water and I'm just flicking water uh, onto the painting just to give it a little more nebulous effect. That'll all run and move together and and give some nice texture. Now I switched to a, a calligraphy style brush. These brushes are by my friend Yu Ming. Uh, he's up in Seattle area. They're amazing brushes. They come in small, medium, and large. And there's a, a white bristle and a darker bristle. And the white bristle holds more water. The darker bristles hold a point. So it's like a dual 
bristled brush, um, but they're just so expressive. Um, you can get a super sharp point with them or they'll hold tons of pigment and water. Here we're going to put some uh, sand or dirt sort of shapes in with some burnt sienna and just working that towards the, the grass and a little bit of dry skippy sort of brush there to give some dirt ground earth textures. Notice how the grass now is starting to just really flow and the, the dusty green, it, the orange and the turquoise are starting to separate out a little bit. That's the 3D effect that I was talking about. It's just magical. I'm going to spend a lot of time with this brush um, splaying the edges out so just little individual bristles will pop out so I can pull grass shapes in and out of darker and lighter places. As long as it's wet, uh, I can still keep working with the pigment and it'll still blend out. This is kind of fun time. It's almost like sculpting. It's as much sculpting as painting, um, working with the different colors and watching them all still kind of flowing around. It's a living, breathing canvas of paper paint. I love to mix my own darks. I don't have any black paint in my palette. Um, ultramarine blue and burnt sienna give me my darks. And then I push them to cool or warm by adding either cobalt or a, or a blue color for cooling it or a crimson or, or cad red to uh, warm up my shadows. And this is a, uh, ultramarine blue and a little burnt sienna. And I might mix a little green in it because I just want to add some, some shadow shapes to, to the grass. And while it's still a little bit damp, I can paint into it and it'll still soften out. Here's a perfect example of me taking the brush and rubbed it on the board there to separate the bristles and now I'm just kind of dabbing away um, to create some foliage and I outlined just the side of the roof there to make a line. That draws your eye to it. It says here's a house. And now with the bristles all splayed out I'm just going to dab around to make the tree shapes. Of course, the cardinal rule of trees is always leave holes for the birds to fly through. Uh, and that's just really important. So as I make these sort of nebulous tree shapes in the background, um, I just have been careful not to make them solid shapes because then they would be hedges. So more texture work in the grass. This is so much fun. I love painting.
working more grass shapes in now, trying to find some balance for my lights and darks. It's so important to save the, the sunspots on the grass, to save the highlights, but at the same time, you need some darks to give it some contrast. And I really want it to have texture like tall sawgrass. And it's starting to dry up a little bit now. It's getting harder and harder to get things to blend in. So again, using the ultramarine blue and burnt sienna, I've mixed some dark and I've switched to a little brush. It's the smaller of the calligraphy brushes. Um, and it's just perfect for whatever reason I found I discovered long ago. I can pick up paint with this thing and uh, with this little brush, I can just cast it. Uh, just like even though it looks like I'm throwing it there, I'm really just, it's going right exactly where I want it to go. Like right along the side of that house, right next to the boat. I'm able to just cast that paint. Um, and I use this all the time, this casting technique for doing foliage because it just throws darks right where I want the shadows to be. And if you ever paint like um, a lot of forestation, you know, fields of tr hillsides of evergreens or, or rows of, of hedges and things and you need to have foliage shadows it's a great technique just to cast in these darks and then I'm going back with my medium sized brush and just softening out the edges uh, and you get shadow shapes in foliage which is I think one of the trickier things to do and you know I'm using this opportunity to pull some of those shadow shapes down and, and to make the, the grass shapes also it's almost like a puzzle it's it's so fun. Now we're starting to see in the grass some of it going into shadow and some of it coming forward. So it's starting to take shape, it's starting to have some depth. little bit of dark right there is very important helps that house to really pop out but not too much
really taken some extra time this painting to um, work the brush and to try to pull some of the darks into the lights and some of the lights into the darks to to make those grass shapes the texture around the side of this hill is going to be really important if it's going to read like oceanside grassy hills have to be really careful at this point though if you throw too much dark into it too much shadow you'll have a bunch of black grass and that's not we w really want to keep that nice sunlight on the on the side of the hill here so I'm really working to protect those highlights less is more Just before I let this rest and let the first wash, and this was really quite a first wash, um, dry, I'm going to take this little flat brush, one of my favorite little brushes, indispensable really. Um, I use it to clean up edges and to soften too hard edges. But I want the house to pop out just a little bit more, so I'm just going to give it a little bit of glow by going in just lifting with clear water, just the tiniest little places on the roof, just so it shines just a tiny, tiny bit. Just dabbing it lightly with the tissue. So that's the first step, nearly finished, painting heaven and earth, the sky and then the ground. Um, it's important to have some continuity um, and letting all the colors move together. That's why I like to do the first big wash and pretty much cover the whole painting. From here, we'll paint the things on it. We'll add some details and some shadows. Uh, and yeah, if you have any comments or questions, I would definitely love to hear them. Please feel free to contact me or leave some comments below. It's always nice to hear from people and get your feedback. So there's step one. Yay. So in the California sun sitting next to a window, um, it didn't take too long to dry. Notice the paper is all flattened out now. I love the effect of the, the way the watercolors have, have blended and moved together. Truly magical. So it's time to put some shadows on, and I want to keep the shadow shapes really, really basic. Otherwise, they just won't read. And I like to mix up a good amount of color so all my shadows match. Again, just for continuity. So you, you can't look at a piece of paper and not see a triangle like that and your brain say to you, oh, this is a house. But this is a great opportunity for, for me to, um, you know, to pick out some eaves and, and to make some roof lines and things kind of stick out. Um, I can define the shape of the house by that first little escapement coming out there, throwing a diagonal shadow on the roof. I'll cut in along the under the eaves and make some posts so that the porch has some posts on it uh, and you can do all that all with the shadows so 
this is one of the most important parts of the painting. It's really where, for me, it kind of starts to live when you put the shadow shapes in. It's heady stuff and it's really fun. And even if I make a, a boo-boo as I do this, at least I'm gonna do it confidently. So I'm painting this in with just abandon. I'd rather make a confident poor stroke than really, really careful good ones that don't say what I want to say. So I'm going to leave out some little white spaces for posts as I just come across there. I'm going to take a tissue and dab off the edges because I want the foliage to come up in front of the house because I don't want the house to be sitting on the edge of a cliff. I want it to be back away from the, from the rise there. And some little shadow shapes in the windows. We'll go back later and do some details on all that, but for right now, it's all real basic shapes. And it's crazy. You have a, you know, you you paint a couple of rectangles and tetrahedrons or whatever they're called shapes, uh, and all of a sudden you have a house there. How cool is that? So if the sun's in the upper left going to the right, then the boat's gonna have a shadow on its right side. And while I've got a little bit of that shadow color still in my brush, I'm gonna just dab these trees just a little tiny bit to give them just, make them just a little more substantial. One of the biggest, one of the most valuable lessons in watercolor painting any of us can ever learn is to control the consistency of the paint. Painting with tea and coffee consistency to get lighter washes, using milk and cream consistency for darker shapes and colors. Um, and then toothpaste consistency paint when you want to make a really bold statement. Knowing how to vary those consistencies is just a superpower. Um, so right now I've, I've mixed up some d uh, stronger darks some thicker darks and using my magic little casting brush, I threw it right where I wanted it to be. And now I'm really trying to give some, some sh real shadow shapes, putting a little punch in there. But that's how you get good contrast in a painting is, is knowing how to make different consistencies with your paints. This is a great opportunity to use some of those darker shapes to make more grass shapes as I paint around it, adding a little more contrast, giving just a little more texture. Ah, so now that's all dried and time for the final step. And this is where we start putting in the finishing touches. It's important to let things rest and dry in between.
Now, speaking of consistencies of paint, I'm using almost right out of the tube cad red to um, do the gunwales of the boat just so they really pop. And this is an important part of the painting. The boat's my focal point, and I want this to really read. A little bit of dry brush there just to give kind of little hints of texture on the side of the boat. There's so much more to a brush than just the tip. You can paint so much with the belly, with the side. You can even turn the brush around and scrape out shapes with the end of it. got some thicker paint on there. I'm going to do some little details in the house. trying to insinuate tree shapes and trunks and limbs and things. And of course the trick is to not overpaint that. I'm going to actually switch to a lizard look here in a moment, a, a fine tip brush to really put the, the little jewels, the finishing touches on. Uh, if you've never used a lizard look, I highly recommend them. It's a, a brush with a big belly and a little tiny fine tip on it. And it's just magic for being able to get little details, to get fine lines. And I think I've signed pretty much every painting I've ever done with a lizard look. It's a great brush. And some little verticals there, poles and things. I'm mixing some dark with the ultramarine and burnt sienna. So I get some black. Now I put just the tiniest little bit of details. Really easy to overpaint at this point. And you know, for things to get too busy. But the house needed a little bit of something, something. I think one of the greatest compliments people can give you in a painting is when they say, oh, I love this. Uh, I wish I could live there or I want to live there or I want to be there. Um, so yeah, I hope when you see this painting, it makes you think that you'd like to spend a lovely afternoon at the side of the ocean in a little cottage. It takes you somewhere. I know it definitely does me Gosh, you know, if you're considering trying watercolor for the first time, I really hope you will. You know, this it's, it's a journey 
from the very first time you pick up a brush or a pencil or find a piece of paper, you know, nobody was Leonardo da Vinci, Van Gogh, Monet their first day. I mean, you start out and and you kind of learn as you go and everything is a, a triumph. If you're in the moment and just painting and the world falls away, it pretty much never gets better than that. So highly recommend you give this a try. Now for the star of the show, a little contrast. Putting some shadow shapes across, some more texture. Again, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to reach out. I'd love to hear from people. I'd love to hear your ideas and your thoughts. And am I missing something? Did I, did I not get something right? Let me know what you think. We're all on this journey together. I'm gonna add little accents of color just for fun. Put a little orange in here and there. Give it a little, a little spice. Yeah, I got the lizard licking, just doing some little fine details here.
Yep, and that's just about going to wrap it up. Sign it and call it good. Hope you enjoyed this. Again, if you have any questions, please feel free to get a hold of me. You can email me, contact me at artofward.com. My email is ward at artofward.com. Till I see y'all again. Happy painting. Peace.